All right, get out your Bibles, open up your course notes, and get out your worksheets. We're going to look at Habakkuk today. What would you think about this book? What would you think about the book? Anybody want to comment? Riley. Setting a blatant theological position, and like the whole book is like this is entirely just about God's justice and the fact that you guys don't understand God's justice. And I feel like the whole answer is, don't worry, I got it. Not he does not God does not explain his justice. He's not explaining yeah. anything. Like I don't know. I'm so confused why about other than like him talking to God directly, why he was satisfied by God's justice. God just said, Hey, I got this. And that's like. So, yeah, the, the point you're making there is it seems a little abrupt that he just says, okay, that's good. Well, no, but he ends with, he praises God, and this is all time, but he ends with, so even though all this stuff around me is happening, like the first 1920, I'm not going to quote it, all this stuff around me is happening still, I'm going to trust you. So yeah. it's not like he's ignoring circumstances, but... <clears throat> it's, it's this huge, like, the problem of evil, like, the great problem, is actually specifically addressed in the Bible. Yeah. But there's no real answer for it. God himself just says, I got it, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, so does that seem too simplistic to you? Is that... I think it should have a shut up about trying to answer that question. Yeah. It's directly addressed in Scripture, and God doesn't ignore it, but he just says, stop worrying. About, like, you're asking the wrong question. Like, yeah, Christians are trying to answer, so hard to answer the question. So, so then you like the way this book actually ends up. Uh, it annoys me and I like it. It's okay, like, yeah. <laughs> sure because we, we, we do want that, that problem answered, right? I mean, the whole problem of evil. It's, it really is a huge issue. And it is interesting. I like the way you're making that connection to the book of Job here. Because it is interesting. At the end of the day, what does God say? How did you put it? I, I got it. I got this. Don't worry. Yeah, I got this. Don't worry about it. You just keep on living the way you need to live, I got this one. And, and so, how do you say that it's both, you both like it and hate it at the same time or whatever it was like, you said? It depends, it like depends on my mood. Like I remember freshman year after like a chapel, it was on like North Korean Christians and I was like, this sucks. Like it was yeah. just horrible and then I turned to- About back. their persecution? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. I turned to it back and I was really encouraged by it. It was, it, there was a lot of just assurance. Um, it just like a burden I felt like was lifted off of me. Um, it's like not your job to write every wrong in the world. But at the same time, it's like, all right, let's look for an answer to how God sort of works with evil in the world. Scripture is just like, yeah, I do. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, that's gonna be super easy to talk to my non-Christian friends about. Yeah. So it depends on your mood. So there's times where the book can be a source of great encouragement. And there's other times you, there can be a sense of, this is not sufficient for me. I don't like the fact that wicked people seem to prosper and can, you know, I mean, if you guys ever read anything about North Korea and, and the persecution that's there, it's just amazing. Um, I mean, it will bring tears to your eyes to read through those books. And somehow we're just supposed to step back and, and let God say, hey, I got it. <laughs> I mean, that can be a hard thing for us. But then there's other times where this message can be extremely encouraging because that's the bottom line. And when you connect this with Job, that's all that Job had too, ultimately, was, hey, I'm God, you're not. I got this thing. Your job is to walk by faith. And I think that w when you guys become parents, you'll understand some of this even more about who God is. It really is amazing the perspective that being a parent gives you on what it means to be God of all creation. Because your, your children can come to you so alarmed by things. You know, in at different stages of life, it's all different stuff. And, and you understand that you can look at them and say, hey, don't worry about it, I got it. You, you can rest in dad. Don't worry about that. I know you don't understand this. I know this is confusing for you, but I got this for you. Now, that's on a human level. And so being a parent will add dimensions to what it means when God says, hey, I got this. 
You just continue to walk by faith, but I got this. And it was incredibly encouraging for Habakkuk. And what makes it more encouraging is that Habakkuk's actually going to have to walk through everything that God says is going to happen. He's going to have to walk through all of that. And that's the difficulty of being a prophet, right? You get, you get brought into what God is going to be doing, and you know ahead of time what this is going to be like, and now you just have to brace yourself and be a, a man a wom- or a woman of God in the midst of it all. And so it's a, it's a very interesting book. What else do you think about the book? Eric, what do you think about it? It's kind of interesting where, when it, like his first like, lament, is just talking about all this evil that's going on. And then when God answers, and then when he laments the second time, he's like, oh my gosh, this is what you're going to do. But then at, the way the book ends with his prayer was just really you know, encouraging. And just the whole coming back to just renew your faith, I think sometimes we kind of forget too more not certain about certain things and what God's doing. Yeah. It's an, it's an incredible end to the book. I mean, those words are hard to say. You know the song where it says, He gives and takes away? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, that song almost always brings tears to my eyes because to sing those words with earnestness requires quite a bit on our part. That means laying everything out there and saying, You give and you take away. Blessed be the name. I will choose to say, blessed be the name. And that's really, Habakkuk brings us to that place. And so I don't know what you're going through in your life um, right now, but we all, I mean, oftentimes our response to pain is we just want out of it. We want it to go away. We want it to end. We want it to be over with. God, if you really loved me, you would take care of this. You would remove it. And that's not Habakkuk's response at the end. Now, in a little bit, we're actually going to Um, try to compare Jonah and Habakkuk. They both have a problem with God, and they both have a problem with justice in who God is. And we're going to do a little comparison of those two because I think it helps us actually work through issues in our own lives when we have concerns and we want to raise those to God. And those will happen for you. And I think when we look at Jonah's life, there's some things for us to learn. And when we look at Habakkuk's life, there's some things for us to learn. And when we compare those two together, okay, you got to ask yourself, which path do you want to walk down? <laughs> you know, the, the one at the end where you're pouting and angry at God, or the one at the end where you're going to say, I will choose to say, blessed be the, the name of the Lord. I, I'm going I'm to trust him. And the righteous will live by faith becomes such an important um, concept for us to grasp. And so we've got to make this real for us. And so let's even begin with application. Look at your worksheets. How did you bring this into your life? How did you do it? Because we've all got laments. Okay, am I the only one or do we all have laments in our life? Well, we have problems with God. And sometimes we, we, we have a temper tantrum like Jonah. And maybe other times we have more maturity like a Habakkuk, but, but how did you apply this to your life? What, how did you land the plane, so to speak? Aubrey, you got one for us? Yeah, um, the very end of this book just struck me. And I, I just really feel like trusting in God, like even when peril arises is a good thing, but trusting in Him, especially when we feel like we're in peril. Yeah. And Yeah. It's hard to live, though, isn't it? What are a number of maybe New Testament passages that come to your mind when you think about the fact that that going through trials and tribulations is not a bad thing, Um, that God's at work? What are passages that come to mind? James? So, count it all joy when you encounter various trials and temptations. Why? Because God is doing something in you in the midst of all that, right? What are other passages? The Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves. So what is that, Hebrews 12? I say a father disciplines a child. And so what does the Lord do to us? Well, he disciplines us. So what does that mean? That means he loves us. So there's two different kinds of difficulty here. Um, the difficulty that you might be talking about and account it all joy would be just stuff that happens in life, whereas there's also difficulty that God brings into our life because he loves us and he's trying to steer us in a certain direction. Other passages? Romans 5. Romans 5. Yeah, perseverance brings about proven character, proven character 
Okay, so you've got that whole, you know, perseverance brings about this, da, 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 it just keeps on, it just adds to it. And you get to the end of that and you go, do I want that? And the answer is yes, I do want that in my life. Well, how do I get that? No, <laughs> I don't want that, you know, but that's the process that we go through. Others? Okay. It's the same thing, right? It's this whole process. And you get to the end and you say, I want that. No, I don't want that. But no, that's the process that the Lord brings us through. What else comes to mind? Romans 8, 28 covers it all for Yeah, so back up Romans a little bit. All creation groans and we ourselves even groan inwardly. Why? Because this world in which we live is under a curse. And God's moving things forward. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. That's hard to, it's hard to see when you're in the midst of whatever it is that you might be going through. Any other verses come to mind? 2 Corinthians 4, though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. So life is beating us up, but, but we're being bolstered in our faith. And so Habakkuk doesn't even get there with all of that. He simply says, okay, I can, I can go through this because I know who you are. And so that's why God's got to be really big in our lives. We really have to believe that God is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He's got to become more majestic in our minds because what Habakkuk is looking at is going to be some difficult stuff. Other applications, what'd you come up with? So regardless of what is about to happen to them, God is worthy of praise. I will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah, and so again, we, we, what do we rest in? We rest in who God is, not what it is that we're going through. I mean, the stuff that you're going through is just tough. Arlen. Yeah. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, that one right there. The idea that when, because when, the, the context of First Peter is suffering unjustly. And so how do, you, how do you work your way through that? You entrust yourself to a faithful creator and you continue to do what's right, knowing, and really that's the message of Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, that you can do this because you know who the Lord is ultimately in the end. What about other applications? What'd you come up with? Yes, Caroline. Um, for me, I put it like wait expectantly for the Lord's answer. Uh, just because I think like one thing that I noticed about Habakkuk was, um, yeah, he was complaining and everything, but he, first of all, he wasn't afraid to complain to the Lord about the injustice that he was seeing. And another thing was he waited expecting God to come with an answer yeah. to prove himself to be good, to be in charge, to be in control. Um, Habakkuk didn't d deny or think that like God wasn't <coughs> doing something. Like I think he's like, why are you just sitting idly? But the thing is, like, I'm gonna wait until you give me an answer. Yeah. Because he knew that God was gonna give something. Yeah. The the word wait, that's the next um, topic that I really want to study in the Old Testament. I have two two goals for this year. I've accomplished one of them, but the second one is this concept of wait. And you get into Isaiah 40. 
Yet those who wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. And Habakkuk doesn't really get the final picture here. He's going to have to wait for all of this to take place. It's going to be a day by day, moment by moment, putting your faith and trust in the Lord. It's not, hey, you won the lottery. It's all over. Yes, I trust God. No, it's this is what's going to happen. And you know in the end that God's going to be good to you and you can wait for him on that. But you got to go through all this stuff. And it just really begins to do a work in us. One more. Who's got one for us? Jeff? Just uh, <clears throat> that we're free to ask questions and uh, that there are times when God does seem silent and that we're left wondering why he hasn't acted and that in times like this, God doesn't act us, ask us to pretend that we're not human or that pain doesn't hurt. Yeah. That he invites us to engage him in prayer and to pour out our complaint before him. Um, while Habakkuk was frustrated <coughs> by what he saw, he brought that to the Lord and said, God, I'm struggling right now. I don't understand why things are happening the way that they're happening. And God didn't rebuke him for asking questions. Yeah. He didn't necessarily give him the answers that he wanted um, or didn't do things the way that maybe he thought it would be best to be done. But he didn't reject him for coming to him and saying, I don't really understand why things are happening the way they're happening right now. Okay, I want to underscore that point. We're going to, we're going to get to this really soon, this idea right here. The freedom to ask questions. Listen, God, God is not afraid of our questions. He's not afraid of our struggles. He's not afraid of us having problems with him. Um, but there is a better way and a worse way um, to approach God. And so we're going to deal with that. But let's, let's get some introductory stuff done real quick. And then we're going to dive into some study of, um, of this particular book. Now you can see on page 107, Habakkuk's main message is, I'm just going to put the righteous will live by faith on here. What were other ways that you said that? How did you come up with the main message? What did you say? Olivia? Okay, sure. Exactly right. There's an ultimate plan far beyond our understanding. Again, that's where Job ended up as well. This is way bigger than you, man. <coughs> Just sit down, relax. Michaeline, how'd you put it? Similar to hers, but um, no one knows the plans of the Lord. Okay, so no one knows the plans of the Lord. The Lord himself does, and he reveals to us what he wants us to know. Blaze, how did you put it? I put, God is sovereign and causes all things to work for his glory. Okay, yeah, so you got that sovereignty in the way God is working things, ultimately to work for his glory. And so you can see that he probably um, prophesied during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah. So we've got a good king on the throne during this time, but there's problems that are about to be ahead for the nation. And so look at introductory comments, page 107. Similar to Jonah, this prophecy is written differently than the other minor prophets, and so that's why we're going to do a little comparison here. Um, as again, much of the focus is on the person Habakkuk. It's a dialogue between Habakkuk and the Lord. And I don't know if all of you can see this over here, but really you've got, you've got a, a Habakkuk gives his lament and then the Lord gives a response and then Habakkuk gives a lament. The Lord gives a response and then you have his final prayer at the end. And you've just got these little introductory remarks there. Um, this is Habakkuk's problem. This is his, um, his prayer at the end. But so it's just, it's just a back and forth. And it's really beautiful to actually hear this book read out loud, especially when people know how to read it. So if you have a Habakkuk figure that knows how to put the energy into this lament and cry out to the Lord, and then you have someone that can actually be that sovereign one who gently walks with Habakkuk through this, it is beautiful to watch this back and forth and then to watch Habakkuk rest with that final prayer is a beautiful aspect too. And so the auditory reading of this can be really helpful to capture the emotion. And that's one thing that the Bible doesn't tell us. You know, there's no inserted, you know, God gets angry here or God smiles. This is a joke. You know, we don't know any of that. The emotion is not there. We don't want to read into it. But we know that Habakkuk's in some kind of struggle, and we know that he ends up in a place of rest um, toward the end. So the starting reality for Habakkuk is that the Lord's words will occur in his own time. In your days, this is going to take place. And so we've got these woes that flow through the book. Um, woes are understood to be um, expressions of grief used at a funeral. I mean, there's a, there's a lament to that. 
And oftentimes in prophetic literature, it is an introduction to judgment as well. Woe to Egypt or whatever it might say. And so we've got the description of sin, judgment, and the reason in Habakkuk. But let's go to, let's go to a small group discussion. I want you to get into groups of three or so. And I want us to consider Jonah and Habakkuk. They both have a problem with God. So what I, I want you to think about these two books. You've done study in both of them. And I want you to think, what is the primary focus in his problem <coughs> with God? The primary focus in his problem with God. And even as I, as I want you to bring this out, what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to think about is, is uh, what, what, are, what, what is the deepest concern and the focus as Jonah wrestles with God and then as Habakkuk wrestles with God. And try to put chapter and verse um, to whatever you put down. Then I want you to think about initial response to God as well as final response to God. And then I want you to think about how is it that they are actually approaching God? What is their method? What is their strategy in approaching God? How do they go about it with God? And then just in trying to get at all these things, what is their ultimate attitude toward the Lord as they go through all of this? Okay, I want you to do each one of these for Jonah and Habakkuk, and then we'll come back together as a class and we'll look at these. So chapter and verse to try to highlight where you find that information and then try to answer each one of those categories the best that you can. Okay, groups of three or so, go for it. Let's see what we got here. We've got a comparison of Jonah and Habakkuk. And so we want to think a little bit. Now, there's a reason why we're doing this. We want to, Jeff was just talking about it's okay to bring our questions to God. Is that how you said that? I mean, it's okay to have questions. Life, life is confusing for us. And really, that's what the poetic books are all about, is they bring these issues to the Lord and try to understand wisdom. How do we live with wisdom in the midst of all of this stuff? Now, just comparing Jonah and Habakkuk, let's see what we can get at when we think about the primary focus in his problem with God. What, what, do, you, what do you come up with? The primary focus. Jessica, what did you guys come up with? Okay, so upset that God, so right here with Jonah, upset that God is going to save Nineveh. All right, Habakkuk. Uh, his desire for justice. Okay, so his desire for justice. And so the focus of his problem is he's, uh, he's upset with what God is going to do, and he's upset because he has a desire for justice. Yes, Brian. Uh, I felt like they both had a very similar focus. Uh, Jonah being that it was a problem with Nineveh's so like injustice and Habakkuk was with Judas and mm -hmm. then later Babylon's. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so just two different contexts in what, in what is taking place. So very similar in their approach. All right. Anyone else want to add to that? All right. How about with what is their initial response to God? What did you come up with? Adam, what you guys got there? Uh, for Jonah, he fled. Okay, so he flees. And what would you say for Habakkuk? He seeks to understand. Okay, so he engages yeah. on some level. God. Yeah. So Jonah's running the other way. Habakkuk's actually coming to the Lord. How about final response? Okay. Um, and then Habakkuk is um, praise and rejoicing. Okay, so you've got some bitter embitterment. You've got worship and praise. All right. What about strategy and approach to God? How do they actually come to God with their problem? Christina, what would you guys say about that? Okay. 
okay? So when you think about maybe their, kind of their posture, uh, more rebellion and more humility, what would you want to add to that, Eric? Either one. Oh, sorry. I was looking at uh, Jonah because we came up with, or actually, Blade came up with, wait until you're cornered. Kind of like that one. Yeah. He did what? Jonah waits until he's cornered. Yes. Yeah. Oh. No other way to go. Uh huh. And then Habakkuk? He just engaged in dialogue. He, he kind of waits on God to corner. Yeah. Waits on God, let, letting God take the lead with this whole thing. And so when you get down to attitude, <coughs> Caroline, what did you guys get attitude? Um, for Jonah, we wrote like anger and frustration. Um, for Habakkuk, um, we put like submission. And so very different posture uh -huh. that they have before the Lord. Let's think about it in this way right here. Um, it's hard for me to ask this first one to, to get at what I'm really trying to get at. The primary focus in the struggle with Jonah is the problem. But yet with Habakkuk, it's the person of, of God. I mean, that's what he's really struggled with. Jonah just doesn't like way, the way the, this life thing is turning out. Um, Habakkuk's got, he's got concerns about that too, but his, his, his actually problem is, is embedded in the Lord. He wants to know, know why this is taking place based on who the Lord is. You know, Jonah knows who the Lord is, or he thinks he knows who the Lord is. He just doesn't like it. So... You know, there's a very different focus, and, and I'm trying to, to show that there, there is a way that we can um, raise questions in life. The initial response is Jonah runs, whereas Habakkuk engages with the Lord. He, he comes right to the Lord with the issue. Jonah's running the other way. Instead of coming and saying, God, hey, listen, I just don't get it, God. Um, why, why would you do this? I mean, don't you know who these people, he just doesn't do it. Do it. Um, the, the status in the end, he's pouting and he's anger, angry. Whereas for Habakkuk, he ends up in worship and praise. And so, especially when you look at these two categories right here, and you think about, well, where is it that I would like to end up? Do I want to end up pouting and angry or worship and praise? Well, wh what, is, what is it that's going to feed this? in this right here. The approach or strategy, I mean, think about it for a second. Jonah just makes these statements. He really doesn't know enough to be making these statements, but he just lays it out there. Whereas Habakkuk, he has questions. He really is seriously looking for answers. He wants to know. Now, he's got something that we don't have. He's got a face-to-face -face with God, you know, whatever that situation looked like. We have to search God's word for it. But he's not telling God, he's asking God about these things. He doesn't have it figured out. He really wants to understand. And we've got to be very careful in the way we bring our questions to God. Are we bringing them in such a way that we already have this thing figured out? The world revolves around us. We know the answers. I mean, that's Job's issue, right? And that was Job's issue. He, he understood everything. But when he got to the end of the book, he realized, wow, there's so much I just don't get. And then the attitude, um, Jonah really has this attitude of refuting God. Well, that's foolishness uh, to be doing that. Whereas when you look at Habakkuk, there's a, there's a posture of fearing God. That's wise um, to fear God, to let God be who he is. And so I think it's really important for us to look at these two books and, and seriously consider it's okay for us to have struggles with God. I don't think God ever says anything to Jonah about his struggle. Um, and with Habakkuk, he engages him. Habakkuk can bring these issues to God, but there's a posture that's really important for us to grasp mm -hmm. in this whole thing. And I think the posture is what's really, really important. I think you find the posture in the fact that Habakkuk goes to the person, that Habakkuk is not telling God, he's asking God, he's really wrestling with this, and, and he, will, he will let God be God. And we have to be content with that sometimes. That's what Riley was talking about at the beginning. I mean, sometimes that's all we're gonna get from God is, I'm God, that's all we're gonna get. Um, I'm on my throne, I'm gonna do good, 
in the end, you wait patiently, and that's, that's all we have. That's it. And that's why when you really get to the bottom of this, the righteous shall live by faith. Riley, did you raise your hand? Yeah. <clears throat> I read that and hear it much. I hear it much more. I guess similar to Jonah at the end of Jonah, as him yeah. being he's upset and then he's seeing or he's seeing injustice everywhere. He's not. This isn't just oh God, why, why don't you? Must I call for help? Like he's, he's upset. No, that's important to bring out. Yeah, I don't want to overstate yeah. this right here. He's is, he is not. No, he's, he's definitely got a problem, right? I mean, both of them have problems. The point that we want to grasp is he's willing to bring this to the Lord. You don't see Jonah with that kind of posture of, you know, Lord, I just don't get you. Why are you? He has much more of a, I know who you are. I know what you're going to do. I don't like it. I'm done um, kind of posture. But yeah, we don't want to remove either Jonah or Habakkuk, that there's a motion behind what, he's, what they're feeling. When Habakkuk first comes to the Lord, he's got some serious issues. So this isn't lightweight stuff. I want us to see that both of them probably feel the weight of their confusion and the, the issues that they're raising equally. And so when they come to God, I imagine that they both have that same emotion. The problem is, Jonah's not bringing that to the Lord. He's got that same weight of emotion, but he's going this way, whereas the back it feels it, he's going this way. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, like, I think, from what I got, <coughs> I think Jonah, the difference between the postures is the fact that, like, Jonah is choosing to hold this anger and not allow, he, like, he's choosing control, whereas I think in that verse, like, Habakkuk is just grieving. I feel like there's like a sense of grieving because I mean like in the last month like I teach at an elementary school and uh, even just yesterday I had to report a child abuse and so like actually while I was working through this I kept wondering like God why is all this stuff happening mm -hmm. but um, there was a time where I was in Sri Lanka and I was seeing all this abuse and I was like Jonah and getting super angry but instead of letting God be God and grieving for what's happening in the world uh, I held the anger, and I was like, no, this, I hate this. I don't like the way this works. But then now, uh, in, the, in the last month, I've witnessed three child abuse reports uh, in just this one elementary school in Norwalk. And um, in doing that, I've seen some, somewhat of like this, like, yeah, I'm grieving for th th this child. That I'm sad that she has to go through this. But it's a totally different approach than how I approach it the way in previous years. Yeah. So this is where we get into a herme hermeneutical issue. We, we aren't told what the feelings are behind what's being said. And I think that if we talk about grieving, Habakkuk's definitely going to have some of that. But, you know, to go back to what Riley was saying earlier, I don't see how we can remove the fact that I think that Habakkuk has some ticked off at God in the same way that Jonah does. I mean, I just think it's there. Uh, even if you think about the way he's talking to God here, he's, he's ticked off. And that's what I want us to grasp. I want us to grasp that, that they feel this similarly, but the way they deal with it is very, very different. And so is there a way that we can feel these things and bring them to God and actually end up here? Okay, Arlen. Judgment's coming to the wrong people. And Jonah, mercy. 
mercy is coming to the wrong people. And it, 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 both of them, it, everything's flip flop from the perspective of the person who's questioning God. Yeah, it, it can be close to that. Um, I, think there, I think you're on to something to, you know, to take that and think about it even more. But remember, Habakkuk's first lament is, judgment does need to come to your people, Lord. So he's looking around seeing all this stuff saying, you need to be dealing with your own people right now. And then he's going to take that. When God gives the answer, that's when he has the problem. Is he really asking for judgment as much as he wants repentance? And instead of re repentance, God's saying, no, I'm, not only am I going to judge Judah, I'm going to take a nation that is by all accounts worse than Judah and use them to judge Judah. And then in the meantime, I'll get around to judging them too while I'm at it. Yeah, we don't ultimately, I don't think, have the answer to that question in this book. But being a prophet of the Lord, I mean, I know he would want repentance of the people. But I think that, that, um, that Habakkuk is, is beyond that right now because he's probably seen God's mercy, 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 mercy. And then the, Judah feeling entitled, 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 entitled. And, and I think Habakkuk just wants that fixed. He wants God to intervene in whatever it's going to take so that these social injustices that he's having to look at and ir ir irresponsible worship that he's looking at, all of that would be changed. Okay, the, the, the thing that you really want to get here is that both of them have an intense issue with God. But the way they deal with it is very, very different. And I love the way we see Habakkuk ends up in a place of worship and praise. Now, ultimately, with Jonah, we can see his status in the end. But remember, let's be fair to Jonah. We don't know the end of that story. You are left hanging at the end of that book. You have no idea how Jonah responded to those final words of God. No idea. Now, you can make an implication, right? Well, we've already seen there's a consistency in character. So if this happened, this happened, this happened, we can probably bet this right here happened. But remember, Jonah had a very positive impact on the nation as a whole. And so he really does have something to bring to the table as far as being a, a man of God, a prophet of God. But this book is pointing us to something. There's a way to engage God that's going to, you're going to end up in a really, really bad place. And there is a way to engage God where you could end up in a proper place. Caroline, were you going to say something? No. no. So that's the contrast I want you to see between these two books. Okay? Very, very important for us to grasp that. Now, let's look real quick at the structure on page 108. Um, with the structure there, we have, there are two major sections. Both are prefaced by his name. So you see in chapter 1, verse 1, then chapter 3, verse 1, um, You've got the chapter 3, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk, and then verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, an oracle, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. And so generally people would see that. And again, this is an antiphony. Um, using this kind of structure right here, going back and forth, you also have that here on page 108 in your notes. There are two cycles of complaint and response, followed by a prayerful response. And that's where Habakkuk shows his posture in the end. And then you also see on page 109 another... Um, way of looking at it, but it's very similar. Complaint, response, complaint, response. But we have these five woes that are in there too in chapter 2 in verses um, 6 and following, 6 through 20. And these woe oracles you find in your notes on page <clears throat> 110. There's a series of these woe oracles and there's a particular focus that each one of them brings. Illicit treatment of people, extortion is taking place. Illicit treatment of people for gain, the treachery that was so obvious in the land. Illicit crimes for profit, the murder <coughs> that was taking place. Illicit treatment of people, sex and murder. And then illicit worship, the idolatry that is there in the land. So Habakkuk does lay out some concerns um, for him. And then he comes to his conclusion in verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I mean, he just lays it out there. And then he regards the Lord in his holy temple in that this is the silence that would be there before him. So 
You can see there's a structure to these oracles as well, the woe, which is the point, and then this use of the word for, or because, or surely, and that's the impact. So you've got point, impact, point, impact, point, impact um, that takes place throughout that. So those woes become a very important part um, of the book as well. Um, but back to page 109, the message of Habakkuk, I want to just, again, just emphasize point A there. The prophets were not simply robots who communicated a message from Yahweh. They themselves were troubled by what was going on in society. They lived in this world and they were disturbed by things. They were struggled. They struggled with these kinds of things as well. And he, when he brings these to God, God's answers initially don't really satisfy him. And so he continues to engage with God. And then he realizes he's got to leave that to the Lord ultimately in the end. So I think that in the book we have a, an amazing um, just explanation of how to approach God in a way that leads to a chapter three experience, especially when we get to the end of the book. Um, again, you, you see the, at the emphasis at the end when you get in verses 16 and following, Again, you see the way he's engaged. I heard and my inward parts trembled. Okay, he's aware of what is about to happen. And then verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, there be no fruit on the vine. Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the, rock, the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me to walk on my high places. And so there's a huge message in this for us. And that's where we began the class was with application and, and how did this impact your life? So as we end class, let me pray for you because it's one thing to see all of this. It's quite another to live it, isn't it? I mean, what we see in Jonah is often what we actually feel and experience in life. We're not real happy with God. And we can throw a temper tantrum. But what we see in Habakkuk, I think, is the reality that we want. That we let God be God and we rest in Him. We look and we wait patiently for Him. And so let me pray that the Lord would do that in our lives. <clears throat> Lord, please help us. Help us to have such a big view of You that we rest. Help us to, in the midst of all that we might be experiencing, the things that we might be troubled by, I pray that we will learn what it means to bring our issues before you honestly, but also humbly. I pray that we would not be afraid to express to you all that we feel in our experiences of life, but I also pray that we would know what it means to yield to you in your sovereignty, in your greatness, in your goodness. And God, if there's someone in this room right now that's having a tough time doing that, I pray that you would give them the strength that they need to wait on you and to trust you in the midst of it. If something's about to happen in our lives, God, please prepare us for that and help us to be men and women who choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. We give our lives to you and all the stuff we go through, we give to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.